Hey everyone, Happy New Year! After taking a much needed break over the holidays, I am back with a, another repair video. So the recent piece I did on the 3DFX Voodoo 2 turned out to be way more popular than I expected. Clearly this card was very special to many people and really brought back a lot of fond memories from a very exciting era of 3D accelerated gaming. It really took everything that made the original Voodoo a great card and just improved on it in every way. And if you haven't already checked out that video, I'll include a link to it in the description below. But before I got the two 12 meg cards I used in that video, and again another huge thanks to Alexander from Germany for sending me his Orchid Righteous 3D2 to make that possible, I had some pretty bad luck buying Voodoo 2 cards actually. I have not one, but two broken 8 megabyte cards sitting in front of me here today. So the first one I bought over two years ago, and it's a Creative Labs model. It's got quite a bit of history with me, actually, and despite a couple of attempts to fix it in the past, I have yet to get it going again. I've actually affectionately named this card the Trainwreck Voodoo 2 because it was pretty badly damaged when, uh, when I first got it, and it's really a perfect example of what happens when one of these isn't stored properly. The cards aren't really unreliable, per se, but... They are very delicate. They've got very fine pitch pins on the on the chips, and uh, the pins can you know very easily bend, even break or detach. And there's also many surface mount components really all over the card that can quite easily break off. So if the card just gets you know tossed loosely in a drawer or a box, bad things will happen to it. This card will get put under the microscope again at some point, but today I'm going to be looking at a different card. This one here is an early revision Monster 3D2. And uh, I got this one last summer. It was sold as is for a great price. And clearly I didn't learn my lesson the first time because it was broken. And when I say early, I mean early. You can see this is actually a revision A PCB here. And if I look at the date codes on the chips, they're all from pretty early 1998. And it's even got a uh, bodge resistor down here, you can see. And uh, at first I thought maybe this was some kind of a repair attempt, but no, it looks like all of the very early diamond cards have this, uh, this bodge here just to fix a uh, defect in the PCB design in this uh, early revision. But when I got the card, I was surprised to see just how clean this thing was. I have not cleaned this at all. I mean, like, look how shiny this thing is. It was really the complete opposite of the disaster that was the creative card. Whoever owned this thing really took very good care of it. I mean, there wasn't a speck of dust on this thing, no signs of physical damage at all. All the pins looked like they were in good shape. All the SMD components were accounted for. All the traces were intact. Yeah, good, but also bad. <laughs> with no visible damage, it's definitely going to be a little more challenging to figure out what's going on with it. So when it comes to the Voodoo 2, having a good understanding of how it works is really important if you want to try to repair one. Although it does share some similarities with a 2D slash 3D card, it's also quite different. And because it has no 2D capabilities, there's no VBIOS to look at anywhere on the card. And it's also a multi-chip solution too, with a dedicated memory bus for each of the TMUs and frame buffer. Anyway, I'm not going to get too much into the card's hardware architecture here, but be sure to check out my last video if you'd like to learn more about the card. So the multiple chips that are on the Voodoo 2 definitely add to the card's complexity, but can actually make troubleshooting and narrowing down the problem just a little bit easier. I didn't want to make this video just about the repair process, but I also wanted to spend some time on the troubleshooting methodology I use with these cards. And I definitely can't take credit for anything I'm going to show you here today because everything I've learned I've picked up from Vogon's threads and other people who have been doing this for much longer than I have. But the information is really scattered all over the place, so I'm hoping this video will be a helpful reference for other people looking to troubleshoot a Voodoo 2. So because this card is really in perfect condition, it should be safe to just plug it in and give it a try. I'm going to use the same test system I did in my recent Voodoo 2 video, which is based on a SuperSocket 7 platform and an AMD K63 400MHz CPU. So everything should be ready to go with Windows 98 already installed and the correct drivers too. So let's see what happens. So right off the bat, I see a pretty encouraging sign. The card's obviously alive enough to register as a PCI device in the system, and the Voodoo 2 driver installs just fine. But after rebooting, I see an all too familiar and dreaded message. Voodoo 2 expected, but none found. And this basically tells me that the card failed to initialize, and from the perspective of the driver, it's really as good as it not being there at all. 
But if I go to the device manager, again, I can see the card showing up just fine and it's reporting that the device is even working properly. I can see that system resources are also assigned here. Let's have a look at the Voodoo 2 display properties page. And yeah, <laughs> the page is completely frozen up and fails to load. Not a good sign. Let's try to launch GLQuake and see what happens. Yep, same issue. The driver fails to initialize the card and reports the same message. It's followed by another similar message saying non-existent SST, SST being the code name for the 3DFX Voodoo. So yeah, really all we know at this point is that the card's failing to initialize and we're not really getting any other useful clues. Thankfully, 3DFX included some really useful DOS debugging tools in their Glide SDK packages, and I'll include a link below in the description to where you can find these. I copied the tools over to a small compact flashcard with DOS 622 installed on it. Let's boot into DOS and see if we can't find something else to go on. So as you can see, there are some environment variables that I've set here, and there's actually a huge number of 3D effects variables that can be used for a variety of purposes. And again, I'll include a link in the description to where you can find out more about these. But the ones I'm interested in here are all related to debugging. You'll notice that some of them start with SST, which is the original Voodoo's codename, and others with SSTv2 for the Voodoo 2. I have them set for both because depending on the application or game that you launch, either may actually be used with a Voodoo 2. Setting init debug to 1 does just what you'd expect. It enables debug logging during card initialization. And the init debug file variable specifies where to write that logging. There's also another called SST debug DAC, which can give you some useful information on the digital to analog converter on the card as well. The DAC debugging also gets written into the same file. I've commented out the lines with init debug file to con, which basically just causes the output to be written to screen instead of a file, con for console. This is useful if the card you know, hangs during initialization and fails to write the logging to a file. At least in that case, you'll still be able to see something on the screen that may be helpful. I wanted to make mention of a few other variables for troubleshooting here as well. The first is text map disable, which completely disables texturing on the card. This takes the TMUs and their memory completely out of the picture and uses only the frame buffer chip on the card. You can also force it to use only one TMU instead of two with the num TMUs variable. But remember, many older games don't support multi-layer texturing and use only one anyway. And you also can't choose which TMU you want to use, but if you're lucky, it may disable the problematic one and help you to narrow things down. You can also change the amount of frame buffer and texture memory used with the FBI and TMU mem size variables. These were intended to be used for compatibility purposes, allowing you to mimic the original Voodoo's memory configuration for games that needed it. But they can be very helpful to figure out if you're dealing with a memory problem. For example, if you disable half your frame buffer memory and the card starts magically working, well, it's a good indication you've got a bad chip on there somewhere. So just two last quick points about 3DFX variables before I move on. First, they don't always work, especially in DOS. It's really up to the game or application whether they want to respect these, so you do have to keep that in mind. And second, if the card completely fails to initialize, then variables for disabling TMUs and setting memory amounts really won't take effect because it's going to bomb out long before it even has a chance to try. In the SDK DOS directory, there's a few useful executables, including Detect and Mojo. Detect will scan the PCI bus for the existence of a 3DFX card, and similar to what we saw in Windows, the card looks just fine from a PCI bus perspective. The most useful tool here, though, is Mojo. Mojo will initialize the card, which will trigger the debug logging output, and it'll also display a lot of useful information about the card, including how much memory it has, whether the TMUs are detected, and the chip hardware revisions, and some other things, too. And finally, we have something concrete to go on. As you can see, the frame buffer is detected just fine. Both TMUs are there as well. But look at the memory amounts. Each TMU should have two megabytes of texture memory, but TMU1 is reporting zero megabytes. So a TMU with no memory at all is obviously not a supported configuration, so not surprising that the card fails to initialize. Let's have a look at the debug level logging to see what happened during that last initialization attempt. So yeah, as you can see, everything appears to progress normally, registers are set successfully, and the DAC is responding just fine. It isn't until we get to the get TMU memory routine where it fails to detect the amount of memory available. It retries five times before giving up. The initialization eventually shuts down with a status code of one, which I assume is a failure code as opposed to zero for success. So we know there's something wrong with TMU1 related to memory on this card, but which TMU is TMU1? 
You'd think they'd be, you know, ordered left to right with this one being zero and this one being one, but it's actually the opposite of that from what I can see on the schematics. So I can't say all Voodoo 2s are like this, but at least with the Diamond Monster 3D2, uh, this one here on the left near the VGA ports is actually TMU1. So what could be causing the memory on TMU1 to fail to detect? And remember, each TMU has its own dedicated memory bus and memory chips. So that means the memory in question is actually limited to just these four chips right here. All of these others are should be out of the equation here. If it was a 12 meg card, there'd be another four on the back. But yeah, just these four chips right here. My first thoughts would be that one or more of the data traces between the TMU and the memory may have got severed somehow possibly a bad solder joint on the TMU maybe. It's also possible the memories failed in some kind of a way that renders the whole bank unusable, but I think that's a lot less likely to be honest. Anyhow, it's time to get this thing under the microscope and start taking a closer look at this area of the card. So common things being common, the first thing I wanted to check for was flaky solder joints on TMU1. Even if all the pins look fine, one or more could have become detached from the pads below and it's sometimes hard to tell. It's a very tedious task because of the huge number of pins here, but I really wanted to check every single one to be sure. I'm just applying a very small amount of pressure to each pin near the base here using an X-Acto knife, but you have to be very careful when you're doing this. The pins are super fragile and they'll really easily bend if you push on them higher up. I also checked the pins on the frame buffer chip just in case, but every single one was really solidly attached and looked just fine. Next, I checked the solder joints on the memory chips. These chips are SOJ40s and they have curled pins that are not too easy to inspect. I'm holding the card at an angle here under the microscope to get a better view. I also poked at each pin just to make sure they were secure, but yeah, they all looked fine. All right, so where to go next? It's possible that one or more of the memory chips on that bus are bad, but I would expect the card to behave a bit differently if that was the case. Failing texture memory will usually result in corrupted textures, not a complete failure of the card to initialize like this. So. I don't really want to just go and blindly replace the chips, at least not until I've ruled out everything else. There is also the possibility that TMU1 itself is bad, but again, Mojo detected both just fine here, and I don't think that's too likely to be honest. My gut feeling is that there's still something preventing communication between the TMU and the memory, and that means I really need to take a closer look at the data traces on the memory bus. Because the traces themselves look perfect and the chip pins were all intact, I think I'm going to need to look at everything else in between. I wanted to take a quick moment to give a shout out to Mariush on Twitter as well. Sorry, I hope I pronounced your name right there. But I was sharing my troubleshooting experiences and he suggested checking all of the resistor arrays on the card. He had some similar symptoms recently and found one on his card that had actually failed. Because of the multiple chip setup on the Voodoo 2, there's a lot of data traces between chips and for the various memory buses on the card. And from what I can see, most if not all of those traces have a resistor in line. Some of them are standalone SMD resistors, but because so many of the traces are in close proximity and need the same resistance value, resistor arrays can be found in abundance here. So resistor arrays or resistor networks as they're sometimes called are basically just a bunch of resistors all squeezed together in a single package. They save space on the PCB and they reduce the total number of required components as well. There's a whole bunch of resistor arrays scattered all over the card on the front and on the back and I started checking them all as well as the standalone SMD resistors as well. Most of them are 22 ohms but there are some 47 ohm arrays on there as well. I wasn't feeling too optimistic because they were all testing just fine until I got to one of the very last ones on the back of the card labeled RA40. Three of the four resistors in the array tested just fine at 22 ohms, but one of them had an extremely high resistance in the millions of ohms. This is basically like cutting the trace completely. There's no visible damage at all to the resistor array, so I assume it must have just failed open at some point and was probably defective to begin with. I must say it was quite exciting to finally find something on this card. But what does this trace lead to exactly? The resistor array is on the back of the card near the frame buffer chip, not the TMU as I expected. So let's do some tracing to find out where it leads. I like to use a thin piece of wire like this to easily locate the opening on the opposite side of the PCB. And on the other side I can see that it branches out to another resistor array, RA17, and to a pin on the frame buffer chip, which is interesting. Let's see what's on the other side of the broken RA40. So if I follow this other trace here, it leads to another via, which I'm going to mark with the wire here, 
And flipping the card over, we can see that this one leads to a pin on TMU1. Aha, uh -huh. so basically, there's no continuity between a pin on the frame buffer and a pin on TMU1. So that pin on the frame buffer also led to the other resistor array that I mentioned earlier, RA17. And I traced that one as well, and it actually leads to TMU0. So it looks like both TMU0 and TMU1 are supposed to communicate with the frame buffer on that same data trace. I'm not aware of any data sheets for the TMUs and frame buffer chips, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that that pin has something to do with memory detection and reporting. All right, so let's get this defective resistor array off the card. I'm going to use my hot air rework station for this, and I've taped off some of the nearby passives with Captain Tape just to prevent them from getting disturbed. I'm adding a generous amount of flux here to the component as well. I apologize for the bad camera angle here, but my hot air station is set up in the garage, and it was super cold that day, about negative 15 degrees outside, and not a whole lot warmer in the garage, so I was rushing it a bit. The hot air made really quick work of it though, it's a bit hard to see in the video, but I was able to effortlessly push it right off the pads once it heated up. And here it is, hard to believe this tiny little component could be to blame. So let's get this thing cleaned up and ready for the new resistor array. I'm just adding some more flux here and using braided copper wick to clean up the pads. And after using some isopropyl alcohol, looks good to go. So here's the new resistor array that I bought from DigiKey. They're pretty cheap, only about 22 cents each, and this one here is made by Panasonic. I wasn't sure of the size I needed, so I took some measurements and it looked like it was a 1206 package. And as you can see, it looks like it lines up perfectly. So if you're ever shopping for RAs, there's two common types out there, convex and concave. The one I'm using is convex, which looks a bit like an IC with protruding legs. The concave type has cutouts, which can make soldering a little bit easier as the solder, you know, naturally wants to fill that void and it helps to prevent bridging a bit. Either type would work here, but the pads are pretty long and the convex type matches the others, so I went with that. The pads look good, so I'm just adding some fresh flux here. And for anybody wondering, the flux I use is Amtec NC559. Really wonderful stuff to work with. I used to use cheap flux paste before, but man, what a big difference good quality flux can make. It's also just a little bit tacky when it's cold, so it does help to hold the component in place a bit once it's pressed down. To solder this on, I'm just holding it in place with my tweezers, and I have a small amount of solder preloaded on a fairly fine tip. And just a quick touch of each contact and pad does the trick. They're spaced out well enough that bridges are pretty easy to avoid as long as you don't use too much solder here. And now for the other side. There we go. Looks good. Let's get this cleaned up with some more isopropyl alcohol. And here's the end result. I think it looks pretty good and really, you'd never know that was replaced unless you looked at it with a microscope or a magnifying glass. Okay, I think it's time to finally test this thing out. So first things first, let's get back into DOS and see if we can get something different from Mojo. And yes indeed, look at that, TMU1 is now reporting 2 megabytes of texture memory. <laughs> Fantastic. So it looks like that resistor array was indeed the problem. If I take a look at the init debug logging, there are no more complaints about memory detection and everything looks good. Just a uh, quick note though, it looks like it still exit with, exits with a uh, status code of 1, so I was probably wrong before. I don't think 1 necessarily means a, uh, a failure it seems, but... Anyway, Mojo's great and all, but the true test will really be to see how it functions in Windows and to run an actual game, so let's do that. So right off the bat, I see an encouraging sign for the very first time I didn't get the Voodoo 2 Not Detected Error message. Let's have a look at the Voodoo 2 Display Properties page. Aha! Uh -huh. Looks like it loads just fine now. And if I go to the System Information section, Yep, I see exactly what's expected for an 8 meg card. Each TMU is detected, and we've got 2 megabytes of texture memory for each one. I'd say it's definitely time to try to launch a game here. And for the moment of truth... Oh, the suspense is killing me. Yes! <laughs> yeah, it lives again. Awesome. Everything looks good so far. Not seeing any corrupted textures. It's running about as smooth as it should at 800 by 600 in a system like this. Yeah, obviously I'm going to let it loop for a while just to be sure, but I think this looks good. <laughs> 
So I'm going to call that fixed. Really amazing that a tiny little passive component like that can render the card completely unusable. But I'm really happy to finally get this thing repaired. And now I can feel a lot better about that purchase, that's for sure. It's also great to have an 8 megabyte card in my collection now that I can use for testing in some future videos. But with this one out of the way, I can finally revisit my nemesis, the train wreck creative Voodoo 2. I have a feeling this one's going to be a bit more involved, so stay tuned. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more retro content like this. Also be sure to check the description below for links and other useful information, how to find me on Twitter, and for a link to my blog. Thanks again for watching.